make a slight correction on the title actually because uh, I do not believe that there is a lack of adoption in the enterprises, but there is a lot of adoption. Um, but there are a lot of challenges which we're going to discuss today uh, also. Um, so I'll start with my own introduction. My name is Tobias. Uh, I was one of the co-founders of Blockchain at Berkeley back in 2016. Uh, and after returning back to Amsterdam, I started my own blockchain consultancy together with two other people. And uh, since then, we have been working with a lot of Fortune 500 enterprises on helping them to build their use cases, creating different concepts, and uh, all sorts of other things. And um, I'd like to go for you, Tom. Sure. Uh, I'm Tom Trub oh, shit. Sorry. I'm I, I got this one. <laughs> Tom Trowbridge, I'm the president of uh, Hedera Hashgraph. Uh, we are a base layer consensus algorithm. Uh, I think most people here probably know what that is, but it's the very bottom of the stack. Um, think of us as Ethereum, but uh, faster and, uh, and a lot cheaper. Um, we were founded by Dr. Lehman Baird and Mance Harmon. Uh, Mance Harmon has two degrees in computer science from Carnegie Mellon, and he actually led the war game simulator at the Missile Defense Agency. So if anyone's seen the movie War Games, he basically ran that program. And he's the non-technical co-founder. The technical co-founder is Dr. Lehman Baird, who has a um, PhD in Carnegie Mellon, uh, which he did in two years and nine months, has about 100 published papers in math. Um, and so the, uh, what we have is, is this um, consensus algorithm, which we can talk more in detail about, but it's proof of stake, uh, which is one of, the one of the kind of features which leads to the attributes of being very fast, very cheap, and very secure. I'm happy to talk more about it. All right. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Leif Lundbeek. I'm one of the founders of Xane and the CEO of Xane. Um, basically, um, I founded Xane during my PhD at Oxford University, and um, we especially um, focus on actually developing uh, distributed AI systems um, on top, for example, of blockchain technology. Uh, and we combine this actually with um, embedded systems. So, um, for example, you can have um, um, an AI decision on a different, um, on a, spe a specific um, vehicle, for example. Um, and actually execute this directly in a vehicle. So, for example, if you have um, a recognition whether the driver is actually a driver, he can have actually access to specific functions in the vehicle. And, um, for example, we also cooperate with Porsche and different um, vehicle manufacturers here on that. So, um, that's about us. Hi. Is this working? Yes. I'm, my name is Marie Leaf. I head up public product for Cadena which is an end-to-end -end, uh, blockchain stack for all types of enterprises. We got founded by the former tech leads of JP Morgan's blockchain group with Scalable BFT, which is a very high-performant permission chain system. We're launching our public network Q2 of next year, Chainweb, which is a graph braiding of individual proof-of-work chains. So we solve scalability on the public side um, and then on top of these two protocols, we have PACT, which is our non-Turing complete smart contract language that has a formal verification library built into it. If you guys are familiar with enterprise production, this is very important for checking, um, just checking your code for nuclear testing sites, use it to make sure the mi missiles launch correctly. Um, we have that open source for the average developer. Okay, thank you all for your introductions, and um, I think all of you have a lot of experience uh, working with different enterprises on different solutions, and I would like to start with uh, Life. So you explained already a bit about that you work together with Porsche on a, on, a, on a project. Could you maybe explain a bit more on like what is the challenge to take that project to a next level, and what are the kind of challenges you see uh, working with these enterprises? Um, I mean, the challenges really working with these enterprises, of course, um, I mean, for, for one, really, the different speed that you have. Um, but I think it's also actually extremely fruitful to actually work with these enterprises um, to actually bring these kind of systems to adoption. Um, because it's, I mean, if you have, of course, like an application that has a consumer focus, I mean, it's a different um, kind of question here. But if you have an application that actually focuses on enterprise system, it's really important to actually really work together um, with them. Um, but for them, it's also um, really hard to really take the risk of um, using a very new technology that has, of course, not really um, done all the different tests and actually is production ready. So um, for them, it's really a risk to actually also see in the future and to think, okay, what might really happen in eight years or in 10 years um, to really bring these kind of technologies to adoption. Um, so for them, it's really an investment. 
Uh, and of course, um, they think rather in really small steps towards that, which is not always really helpful here. So um, it's really um, some kind of really partnership than actually really a, just a client um, relationship where you actually also have to take certain decisions um, to actually bring this technology forward and to take really your vision in this normal um, relationship while they work really more on the practical use case side, which might be a very, very, very small use case. So the adoption, I think, is really from small use case to the next small use case. But you really have to make sure that you actually see this vision and you really manage to get from these small use cases to the actual bigger picture. So I think that's really the, um, the really critical task here. What's your you know, I think I'll take this in, in two directions. So there's one type of use case which is not um, transaction heavy, um, but has the potential to disrupt industries. And think about putting titles on, on a distributed ledger. And so you want to put titles on distributed ledger. That doesn't require high performance. It doesn't require really fast time to finality, but it does require buy-in from lots of industry participants and has the potential to disrupt massive markets with, um, that are very lucrative. And so anytime you're going to do that, you're going to run into resistance, and it's going to take time. But eventually, it will happen. It's just a question of time. So I think that is sort of embedded interests that you're going to disrupt are going to make life difficult for you. And that's true in any industry, certainly true here. So that's sort of point one. But the other area I'd go into is how early stage we are right now. And I think of us as sort of the 56K modem stage, where the business models that we take for granted on the internet right now, no one conceived of in 1996 or 1998 even, necessarily. Um, and it's only post-broadband that the really compelling use cases for the internet became available. And so I think that when you can scale at 100,000 transactions a second, like we can, or the pricing for a cryptocurrency transaction, instead of being 30 cents like is on Ethereum, is you know six millionths of a penny, or 10 thousandth of a penny like is with us, you open up entirely new use cases that I don't even have the imagination to fully appreciate, but I know are considerable. And there, you actually have adoption of new areas which have to be built and may disrupt businesses, but you're no longer relying on those businesses because you're creating new ones. And I think that is a whole nother avenue which we will see, um, which is, I guess, a different path than partnering with existing enterprises. Marie, do you have any opinion on can you repeat the question? Can I repeat the question? So uh, you have been collaborating with a lot of enterprises. That's what you also say on the website and everything. And I was wondering what kind of challenges you see to help them. Yeah, I think um, we spend a lot of our days talking to clients and talking to enterprises and informing them about why they don't need a blockchain. I think luckily we've kind of we're getting into the trough of disillusionment where we're not getting those the CTOs throwing blockchains at everything, the CMOs wanting to throw blockchains at everything. Um, and so I spent a year of my life at Cognizant, which is one of the largest systems integrators on their blockchain team. And the dream there was consortiums. Let's build consortiums for this industry, for this industry, for this industry. And to build a consortium, you need on average between 50 to 190 different stakeholders from across like four or five companies to all get buy-in from the CSO, CIO, CMO. The coordination risk failure is super high. Where we've seen a lot of um, movement, and by movement I mean incremental movement, um, is in these what I call pseudo consortiums where they are led by a, the dominant player of that industry who then brings in other people to share their data. So it's not boil the ocean with this R3 big consortium. It's have spearheaded um, people leading the consortium and building out and POCing in like small ways. Could you maybe elaborate a bit more on that? Because I have a trouble understanding like if you have one dominant player within a single industry, is it in a similar industry, like a, the, the, the same industry? Or is it, for example, in a supply chain where you have multiple actors? Yeah, so um, this specific case that I'm thinking about is in one, it's in the healthcare industry, and it's um, the management of provider data, so healthcare provider data. The economic incentive was strong enough for all the partners that this one end company um, uses in their supply chain, the 
incentives are strong enough for those people to want to buy into their marketplace. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Tom, I um, we discussed during the phone call, and there's um, always been a little bit of a hype around Hashgraph regarding the patents and everything. Um, could you maybe explain a bit more on the reasoning why you made the decision to go for that strategy? Certainly. So this is one of uh, kind of the most controversial components of our uh, of our company. Uh, we have uh, three issued patents, and we filed for more. Um, that runs against the kind of open source ethos, which is you know dominant in the distributed ledger uh, community, uh, which I, we certainly are very aware of and appreciate. You know, our view is that open source generally, historically, has led to terrific software outcomes. But when you combine open source with crypto economics, you end up with a perverse incentive for forking and for disruption and for lack of stability because of those economic incentives that actually only rarely results in um, significant development generation. And so rather than, and so we think that, you know, Bitcoin has had 44 forks and how many of those have actually added value? You know, I think in this room, people are probably more sophisticated than most, but we can probably name a handful of those at best. So our view is to have a patent not to, not to capture value, but rather to prevent forking. And so most of our token supply is owned by the treasury, which is, has a, which is basically owned by a council, which we can explain in turns over time. And so actually isn't owned by management, isn't owned by investors. And so it's not a value capture, and we actually are going to release the code so anyone will be able to see it and review it. So it's also not a lack of transparency. Instead, it is an attempt to engender stability. And so when people, when enterprises, want to invest millions of dollars in building applications on top of us, they will know that there will not be an authorized fork or an unauthorized fork that could happen the next day. And for an enterprise to spend a year and spend four or five million dollars building a mission critical application, and the next day the layer, the base layer forks, they then are left wondering which of these two forks do we support or which should support our application. Then it could fork again. We think that does not lead to investment and that does not lead to enterprises adopting this technology. There are plenty of opportunities to build on open source um, protocols in the market, uh, and we're giving an alternative to that. And I think we're probably the only one right now, maybe we'll see more down the road, um, but, that, but our view is that that uh, protection will actually give enterprises comfort to make the investment to build mission critical applications on top of our ledger. So anybody? You have a um, I'd first off like to disagree that that's the most controversial part of uh, what Hashgraph is building, but I don't understand from a fundamental first principles point of view. Um, one, you mentioned that you are going to be sharing the code, so there's going to be transparency. I don't really understand how you could be sharing the code enough for transparency that won't allow for a forking of the network. And two, um, the whole point of decentralization is censorship resistance, and I just think that's a, it, it, it's just sort of keeping the status quo of like, and kind of a hack around security, rather than looking at the fundamentals of what makes a public blockchain uh, defensible and really secure. Um, we personally think that you have to open source your public network. Not from the private side, mind you, we are taking out patents for um, features and products on our private side offerings, but for a public network, I don't see how you could eventually get large enterprises or anyone to, to trust your network when it's a proprietary code base. So, so to, to address um, those two components, for first, all the code will be released, so you'll be able to see everything, so you could actually copy it. That will be technically possible to do. Our SDK is available now. You could figure out the code people have and have tried to copy it and are trying to replicate it now. And when the code is actually released, you will have the technical capability. It will exist to be able to do it. And we expect some people to actually do it. The difference is it will be legal to do so. So you have the capability and the transparency is fully there, but it won't be legal. Now, what does that mean? Will we have to enforce that patent? I don't think so, because what 
really serious applications who've raised a lot of money are going to build on a ledger that's viol in violation of a patent. That's always a risk hanging out over them. I don't think that'll happen. Some might, and that's totally fine, and we're comfortable, probably comfortable with that. But that's a risk, and I don't think we're gonna need to do anything, because I think that's just a big disincentive to do it. So transparency is fully there, and I think that will make everyone comfortable to build on top of it. So that's point one. In terms of security, point two, um, we are asynchronous, Byzantine, fault tolerant. That is the highest level of security possible. Is, you know, put another letter in front of BFT and it almost doesn't count. And we actually have a formal methods proof of this, uh, which we are going to release shortly. The math proof is in our 2016 white paper, but we actually did a COQ proof um, using formal methods of the ABFT nature of our algorithm, which means it's actually the most secure algorithm out there. Life, anything to add? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to the technical level, but I mean, um, staying on the, on, the, on the actual question, I actually think that, um, that what you say is, is correct. I mean, also um, in, terms of, um, s of in terms of risk, really, for enterprises, um, I mean, I worked on the other side, and I mean, it's, it's really impossible to take um, actually a complete um, open source technology um, for an enterprise that doesn't really have um, at least a certain, s certain copyright and, and really um, organization behind it that actually um, takes also the risk together with the enterprise. So um, we also do think that, that pat patents really help in, in here. It doesn't really mean that you need to enforce it or so, um, or that you, that you don't really need to show it. I mean, I think read transparency is quite important here. Um, but also at Xane, I mean, we, we also applied for a certain uh, for, for a few patents um, for, for actually protecting the technology, but we still also um, open source it. I mean, it doesn't really um, doesn't really contradict. Um, them. Okay. And there'll be open source components. Our wallet will be open source, so there'll be a variety of elements of it as well. There'll be open source. It's just the consensus algorithm, which will which will be um, which is which is patented. Clear. So Marie, I was wondering, basically on the, um, you provide two types of solutions. So one is an open blockchain, one is a private solution. And could you elaborate maybe a bit more on the, the reasoning why you provide both a public and a private one? Uh, and where do the enterprises go for? Is it the private one or is it the public one? And where do you see the future going? Yeah, so this is uh, a very nuanced qu answer. Um, I think we as an industry don't know exactly how we're going to evolve and we as a company think that there's going to be some sort of hybridization between public public access and private chain um, throughput security and needs and we want to be at the we want to be end to end for when that happens so for example there's an interesting use case for an advertiser who has a form, um, piece of form advertising that users can fill out and get compensated for in their public token, but on the back end, that gets transferred to a private chain consortium of advertisers, publishers, and that gets traded in a private consortium network, but from a user interface level, that is the public side. So we're seeing little cases like this. Um, so that's our thesis. Okay, and if you, for example, if you look at more of the token model and these enterprises owning a token and um, including their tokens in their business models, how do you see the adoption of, of this coming up? For example, an automotive company owning tokens for a certain use case or could you maybe tell a bit more? <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I have a bit of a contrarian view on uh, the ICO crypto economics. I cringe whenever I hear the word crypto economics because um, at the end of the day, it's still economics. It's not, it's kind of like computer science learning about politics and economics for the first time. Fundamental human behavior will still have to hold up for a crypto economic model to work. So in terms of like a token for um, one industry, you have to look at like the same dynamics, the Mundell Fleming model across countries, right? Are there capital res or are there capital controls? Is there a pegged um, rate? Is it 
independent monetary policy. Like they still act as individual currencies. And I think um, some industries are defensible in that way. So if you have like a commoditized um, information service or like a digital service, so like cloud computing, I actually think could have a defensible uh, industry token, but something like cars where there's still so much, um, I guess, fiat granularity around how that gets priced and the supply chain around that is a little bit too, too cloudy in my mind to okay. see how you would build a defensible currency for that. Do you have any opinion on this uh, life from your perspective? Um, Actually, I think it's 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 a good way to actually have also both offerings. Um, I mean, the the public um, side is really the entry point, um, but there can be always um, speci very specific business models um, where you have actually I mean too too much risk to actually involve um, every party possible. So um, I think actually both sides can can live quite well. I mean. The word private is then, um, of course, I mean, uh, debatable here. I mean, uh, what really does that mean? I mean, uh, if the consortium is quite large, I mean, it's, it's almost public. So, um, but I do think that there is really these kind of two, two possible metrics where you have um, a very global thing, which is completely permissionless, and you have some permissions inside. Uh, what clearly doesn't really make sen any sense is um, something that only is for one organization or one one person basically I mean that's that's I think uh, not really a valid use case um, you know I think to 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 touch on that and also to agree with Marie a little bit I think most think about what the use for tokens are out there and why do we have and what are they necessary for and I think the transmission of value with low cost is one and the ability to transmit small amounts of value is another and then the question is, are there other areas, maybe not, to, maybe the ability to take a float is a, is, a, is a third area, there could be others, but those two, the fee, frictionless, fee list, fee -less ability to transact, and the minute increments are key. Question is, do you need to have your own native currency to do those things? You probably don't. A digitized, even fiat currency is probably possible to do that, and probably serves the purpose of 90% of digital currencies out there, maybe 98%. Um, but to Marie's point, you also could have certain ecosystems that are large enough that it can drive and force the adoption of a digital currency. Think about Amazon. If Amazon offered everybody a 5% discount, if you use you know, Amazon token, it would probably get a lot of use. And Amazon would probably profit from the float and from the ability to do that. That's, an, that's a, a, a potential um, area where the market power could be strong enough to actually drive use of a token that's company specific, but there are very few examples of that. I think in very few ecosystems of that scale that would really have a chance to supplant a digitized fiat currency or digitized um, or, or sort of dominant um, stable coin or, or whatever else it might be. Thanks. So. Um from my personal experience and what we've been doing with a lot of enterprises, I see a big disconnect between protocols or companies that actually develop the technology and the enterprises. Um, and this creates also sort of a tendency of enterprises to, to not really understand the actual use cases of blockchain. And I'm wondering, like, how do you all as a protocol educate enterprises or how do you let them learn what the possibilities are for a solution? Um, and how do you do this? Tom, sorry, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, listen, it's an it's a it's an ongoing challenge, and you know the good news for us is that a lot of enterprises have dedicated blockchain teams, and so they have teams that have purely focused on picking the right, um, what the developing the appropriate applications across the company, figuring out where that is, whether it's supply chain, whether it's customer management, whether it's loyalty, whatever it is, and then figuring out the best ways to implement that and the best layers to work on top of it. So usually the sales component is more or less being accomplished by teams within those companies. So it's our job to figure out, the, to ha convince them that we're the appropriate base layer on which that should be built. It's other people's job to figure out they're the right system integrator to build it. Um, and it's that team's job generally to educate that whole company. You know, give you an example, um, you know, at, at Goldman, uh, the blockchain team there does monthly meetings with senior management 
to educate them on what the capabilities are, what the use cases are, and where it's going. Because as you can imagine, even in a company like Goldman, you know, there is still a lot of learning to be done. And I'm not singling them out because they're more sophisticated than most, and they have a big team which is highly sophisticated as well, but it's that type of internal sales which is happening, but at least they've built teams that are doing this. And they're, they're that, which is, I guess, some larger enterprises, there's plenty of enterprises, and I've found more on the West Coast, which are further behind and don't even have those sophisticated teams in-house. Life? Um, yeah, my, my, I, I actually have quite a similar view on that, but as an additional, so I think it's, it's always there's two types of companies. I mean, there's the ones that actually try to kind of buy in this technology and um, give you basically the task to do the job and uh, to create the use cases. And um, I mean, for those kind of companies, you definitely need a partner company like, for example, Cryo or s some other companies um, that actually does the integration job. But I also think um, the other companies that actually do have these kind of teams, they are much more important in terms of adoption. Um, and also we, I think, think that really um, you need kind of like this partnership relationship that they actually create th new things together with you. Because otherwise, it's actually just a sales job and um, it will actually really end up nowhere. You just have like a small use case, you sell this, and that's it. Um, but that's really not really taking you um, anywhere you, where you have actually this kind of um, interoperability between different corporations that actually do work together on these kind of things. And does that mean that these kind of companies also invest or have ownership within the solution that you build? Uh, n not necessarily. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, depends really on. I mean, um, in many cases, it's really more about the application that um, is built on top of these protocols um, and not about adapting the protocols to their needs. Um, I mean, but obviously that depends on, on the case. I mean, if there is, for example, a military use case or so that has like s certain special uh, I don't know, needs for that, I mean, that might be the case. But in most of these cases, I think it's more about uh, co-creating um, on the actual application and, and giving also feedback what might... Um, um, the protocol actually need to have as f as further features, for example, to really match to the use cases. Okay, thanks. Marie? Yeah, I would like to echo that and um, two things. Echo that um, and stress the importance of systems integration um, as a building out a partner network. Maybe I grew up on the systems integrator side and I have a bias, but y like I saw MongoDB, my firm brought MongoDB from just this you know, sort of obscure database technology to the enterprise, we built a solution for it, for MetLife. Um, and like having those solution partners is super important. Also from our team perspective, we luckily were built under the evolutionary pressures of a large enterprise. So Will um, Martino and Stuart, Stuart Popejoy, they were, vetting all the vendors, blockchain vendors coming to them, um, the Ethereum guys saying, we want to build like production ready stuff on your, for, for you. And Stuart likes to joke, if I brought, brought Ethereum to my boss and told him it wasn't upgradable, I would get laughed out of the room and fired on the spot. So those kind of little things impact. We, all, we have, um, we have upgradable contracts. Every single contract, we call it atomic governance, is um, not dependent. When you set a dependency, you're able to um, sort of control that dependency. Therefore, it's uh, very, it's a lot safer to roll out in a GDPR um, compliant area, as well as uh, you don't get into like the parity multi-sig attack wouldn't have happened. I have two more questions left, but I also would like to open up uh, questions from the public. So I don't know if anybody has a question. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll just. So looking at non-tokenized enterprise adoption, I'm curious what the panel's take is on the Walmart, IBM, Food Trust, and its rollout over the last couple of weeks or months, and then announcement last week. Yeah, so I'm laughing because that was actually in my notes um, when I was preparing answers for this. I don't know the details. I haven't actually read the article, but I was at 
I don't know if anyone follows Jill Carlson on Twitter, but she likes to joke about how, you know, supply chain management, the fundamentals of what supranational blockchain provides is sure supply chain management across countries. That doesn't mean that I need, as like a yuppie living in New York, I need to know that my banana is organic, right? It means for areas like liquefied natural gas, you can track the supply chain to make sure there isn't corruption and things getting skimmed off the top in like being docked in Russia along the way on its trade routes, right? It's like, that to me is just a silly marketing thing. Yeah, I, I guess I just say that seeing companies of that scale put investment and, de and actually deploy the technology that publicly and that wide and, and to that level, again, I can't tell you exactly the, the um, you know, how many stores it's in. I can't tell you exactly how many trucks it's using, but that level of announcement is only positive for this industry and for everybody in this room and is only gonna lead to more focus on it, more attention on it, more deployment by other enterprises and more investment in it. And so I just, I, you know, without even knowing the details, the mere fact they're out there announcing it, talking about it, doing it is gonna lead more people to do it, which is gonna lower costs and just drive more adoption. So excited about it. Yeah, I actually also think, I mean, this is, this is actually also what I meant by these small, very small use cases um, that actually step by step take you towards the actual goal. So. One more. Um, hey, um, just about the patents real quick, a little pushback if you don't mind. Um, I just feel like if you look historically, there are countless examples of open source projects that um, people that are extremely stable and companies build upon, especially if you think about the internet protocol itself, which is kind of like a consensus algorithm if you think about it. And every single software company in the world essentially builds on top of it. So just wondering what you think about uh, stuff like that. The, the, you know, I, I, I certainly get it, but there are no crypto economics associated with, you know, TCP IP or, you know, the internet protocol. So there isn't a value in forking it. And if that was tokenized, there might have been five, it's actually fascinating to think about. If it were, there were tokens back when that was made, would there be five different, 10 different, 20 different competing internet protocols? I don't know. And I think that the benefit we have is that there's one. And that fact there was one is what has allowed the whole ecosystem to be built up. Um, so I think that that's a lucky thing. I don't know kind of, you know, counterfactual what would have happened if there had been economics associated with it. Uh, so I appreciate, and I also will say that while you're right, a lot of terrific software has been built open source. You know, there's a lot of terrific software that people in this room use every day that's been built closed source. And I mean, anyone who holds one of these cannot be too much of an open source zealot. I'll win back. <laughs> great, to, great just to hear a couple applications that just absolutely startled you. I mean, the liquefied natural gas was a great one. The title one's a great one. Just a few that just begin to show some of the magic to a non-blockchain oriented audience when you go to talk to senior management. Sorry, what was the question? What are you? Uh, you know, two or three applications that have struck you in your work that you can talk about from your clients that have really managed to break through to senior management that is not blockchain oriented about the magic of what you're doing. I don't know if that's, anyone, do you want to address that? Do you, I'm happy to take a stab. <laughs> Sorry, um, to senior management of the client itself, or? Fine. So, so here, here's one example that I use, which may be too simplistic, but I say, you know, if I gave Tobias a dollar right now, and then next week I say, hey, Tobias got my dollar back, he could say, no, you never gave me one. And I said, no, I did. And so we have a fight, and there's no way to verify it. 
And if I, and so what do we do? I give it to him through PayPal, through a bank, through a credit card, through a check, through whatever. That's, and that's the intermediary. But then I say, you know, instead, I give it to Tobias and everyone here witnesses it. And because everyone here witnesses, we know it happened and there's no more bank, there's no more middlemen, there's no anything. And so that example takes it, makes it very clear to people the role that intermediaries play in the financial system and the val verification process of distributed ledgers and how the intermediaries are no longer necessary. So I guess that's just a very basic, simple example. I don't know if exactly what you're looking for. It's not a complex use case, but that gets the message across as to how this technology works and ways in which it can be deployed. Does anybody have another example? Should we, uh... um, so I mean, th this is kind of a canonical example at this point, but the use of um, IoT sensors along the supply chain to make sure that um, vaccines or medicines are kept at the correct um, temperatures, the correct air pressure um, to sort of prove to the counterparty the quality control, I think is a one that sort of strikes everyone as an obvious, obvious example. But I actually think, I mean, that that's a use case that actually, um, I mean, it doesn't really strike you immediately why blockchain is really like the right technology there. I mean, uh, it might be better with blockchain, but I mean, it's also manageable without blockchain. So I think, um, I don't really think that there, there are that many use cases that immediately strike like senior management here because most use cases with blockchain technology actually need several large enterprises to actually work together here. And this is a very, very complicated um, thing, and it's not really something that easily is um, set up. And I think it's more the work of um, people below senior management in, in really long negotiations and over many years to actually really come to um, the situation that you actually can make these use cases work. Um, all the other use cases, I think, are actually quite small. And I mean, also, if you hear that, I mean, with the... Um, the gas use case, for example. I mean, it's it's um, it's quite a large use case, but actually, it's also extremely specific. So, um, I mean, um, it's it's one of the most, I mean, or the rather very simple use cases. But also, those use cases actually need all the different parties to work together, and it's something where you can't just go to the senior management and say, L let's do that, because you actually need also the other parties to work together here. So you just have like very specific POCs to actually prove it, and then you go from POC to MVP and so on. So um, I think it's really about technology here, and that just needs um, takes time. So it's not really about just going to the senior management and say, let's do that. Yeah, my take on this is uh, you just need to explain and what are the characteristics of the technology yeah, because a lot of people talk about trust, explain why blockchain sort of creates trust and what I always say, uh, do not trust but verify because basically blockchain provides a mechanism to verify and then inspire them with a couple of use cases. So I think all of the use cases that have been mentioned, let them think about stuff that they can do with their company but there's always one restriction. Solving internal processes with blockchain is not the best solution. You should always search for partners outside of your own company um, that can provide you data to enhance your internal process, but also create value for the other party. Um, and I think putting those up in the line and telling the senior management in this order, I think allows them to think about what they could do with uh, with blockchain. And for to close off, I would want to say, uh, ask one more question on, so you need half more companies if you start a consortium, right? Like, um, so let's say with Hashgraph, you get a few companies aligned, a few healthcare providers, uh, maybe a few automotive companies, maybe a few banks, whatsoever. What are the three things that these companies should watch for when they start such a consortium? You know, I guess we are, we're building a council which will govern our network. That's different than building a consortium of companies in a particular sector to do something. We may do that also, uh, and there are certain sectors that I think will have particularly use cases. Per, you know, uh, finance comes to mind, and there are others. So I can see that happening. But for us, our challenge and our opportunity is attracting, you know, Fortune 100 companies 
to basically host initial nodes and serve on our governing council and put their names and brands associated with us and actually run our algorithm on a server that they control. And so that's a far bigger, and actually sign up to an LLC agreement, which is a far bigger ask than a joining a consortium of two, 10, 50, 100 companies to do something that's actually relevant to that sector. And so, you know, our, our, our proposition to them is to, help, um, is to help set the pricing and set the governance of what we think is kind of the next generation of the internet. Uh, I mean, we, we also have this idea of, of actually having more like the structures of how you can actually set up, um, I mean, a, a governance structure basically to work together here so that you can easily take. I mean, it's, um, it's of course, much more complicated than, uh, than, I mean, in a plug and play technology because you actually what you need to achieve is like a plug and play governance structure here. Um, and that ov obviously also takes time and I think um, one has to also look for the readiness to actually um, also participate in the creation in, in these kind of structures. Um, obviously, um, I mean, companies or, or projects like, like Hashgraph and, um, and Xen and so has to have to leave, uh, to, to lead really these kind of, this kind of creation, but you also need really very strong followers to actually, to actually manage this kind of creation. And then there is like a next, um, kind of step to actually have the ones that just want to use this to, to plug in basically. But I think it's really, um, you need really the companies that are ready to, to support this strongly. Marie? Uh, yeah, so top three things technically to ask if your um, enterprise is one, do you, you actually need a blockchain? We get this one a lot. Um, we spend a lot of our time answering no. Two, um, is your consensus algorithm, if it's a private consensus algorithm, does it hold, do transaction speeds hold up across 100, 200 nodes, like an actual distributed system? A lot of these private chains, sure, they boast like high throughput, but after three or four or eight, in the case of um, a large uh, private chain, after eight nodes, they start to degrade. So one, so two, how many nodes does this actually scale across? And uh, given an unpredictable workload, does it cause congestion in one part of the region of the network? And then three, technically, is my smart, smart contract language safe? Um, can I bug, like, write in arbitrary bugs for logic that I should not be uh, implementing on the blockchain? Okay, thank you. I think we're out of time, and uh, I would like to thank all of you for your clear answers, and uh, yeah, have a great day. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.